Education is such a major part of heart, and when we started it, and the scripture that I believe that God gave us for it is, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And when we first began, you know, we were trying to think of a name, um, we decided that our name would be Health Education Africa Resource Team, and HEART would be the acronym. We're known as HEART. But the part that we were really focusing on was that first part of it, health education. As time went on, we then realized that we are really a resource team. And this became very clear to me when we were doing home-based care. We were traveling uh, into the different slums and we were actually visiting people that had AIDS. One of the things that has resulted from this huge epidemic in Southern Africa is the creation of orphans. I don't think our country has ever in its history, even in the 19th century when parents died young and left many orphans, has ever had to deal with anything close to this number of orphans. There are hundreds of thousands of orphans in a country with a population similar to that of California. But as we were in the villages, then they would say to me, well, Mama, what's the next step? You know, are you coming back? What about the orphans? What about the widows that we're trying to take care of. Do you have any help for us? Do, is there anything we can do? And that's where we got the vision about WEEP. It's difficult to imagine what the majority of people with HIV AIDS face on a daily basis in their, in their general life. The women in the WEEP program uh, are women who were near death. Um, most of them were what we would call emaciated. For example, um, a person my size weighing about 90 pounds. And with treatment, they are now fully healthy, well-nourished, and taking care of their children. If we could keep mother alive, focus on her so that she could take care of her children, we could do an orphan prevention program. As a program, we came in to step in to assist women who are HIV in the community, and when we believe that when we support the woman, the child will live. Basically, it is the women who take care of children. And most of the women had been either divorced or they've been separated or their husbands deserted and they were bedridden. And in the process of the mother suffering, the child suffers. We were teaching on bed nets and that everyone should have a bed net. So I got the idea, what if these women <laughs> could make the nets. We are happy that we've been given a privilege to make these nets because apart from giving us an income, the nets also go into preventing malaria and reducing the death rate of children and pregnant women and people all over the nation because heart distributes nets to children and even to pregnant mothers and all over our country. So the Wheat Project has grown from that one small little group to now we have five centers. In those five centers, we have more than one group that has begun. USAID has come alongside us. They're helping with funding through uh, Academy of Educational Development, AED, a capable partners grant that we have. So it's, it's been a real exciting journey even to see these women come from near death to alive, working, looking well. Uh, their neighbors are telling them, that they are cheating them because surely they don't still have AIDS. I was stigmatized by my family members. They even end up buying a coffin for me. But I thank God for his mercy, he giving me mercy. And when I came, even my friends couldn't know me that they called me a ghost. Now these women can now train other women to survive, 
to prosper and to take care of their children. These women have all come from far. They all have a story. I know each person has a story of their own in life, but these women have come from so far. Most of them are taking care of two children and more. Some are taking care of their foster, of foster children because their sisters passed away, their brothers passed away, and the children were left without anyone. So most of them are mothers and guardians to over five, six children in the same home. Yet these children through whip, they're now going to school. They now have uniforms, they have food, they have rent, they have, they have, they are secure, they have benefited, their children have benefited, the children who are uh, stigmatized in the society, in school, they are now going back to school. Their performance is far much better from where they started. And therefore we are hoping that this project will go on and we'll be able to support more and more women because our motto, one thing we believe, is the woman is stable, the children will live because the women will take care of the society, yeah. All of our programs kind of are interrelated and we wanted an acronym, we wanted a, something that kind of says, okay, these programs are, are one, even though they are different parts. So we came up with the acronym COPE, Community Orphan Prevention Through Education. With ed education continuing to be a real key focus for HEART. Within COPE we have WEEP and then we also have what's called Kids for School. And Kids for School is a program for upcountry for grandmothers that are raising their grandchildren. Parents have both died from AIDS. The, how the project runs is that uh, the children are supposed to they get one uh, female uh, goat and after one year, they're supposed to give one goat to the next kid in the program. So once we enlist, let's say, 50 kids in the program in a certain area, we tell them, okay, you see, we have benefited from uh, this program by getting a uniform and a goat. If you don't have a school uniform, you're not allowed to be in school. And uh, now, HART is assisting them with the school uniforms. They are giving them a goat shoes so the kids are able to go to school. We let the child know that he can also actually have something. That when he is at home, he says, this, this God is mine. The other people would say, you mean that he also has a God? Because initially they were thinking that they are completely a destroyed generation. And then telling the child, look, this God has to be taken care of. So that next calf that comes in, you give it to another child of a similar need. If you give us a goat back to the program, which heart will not take, but it will be going to the kid who is also in need as you, will give you another uniform. The grandmothers were coming to me saying, Mama, my kids are not in your program, please. My children are not in school. They're hungry, they need help. Help my children too. And it really hurt because we, we now had 50 that had now produced into 100, but there were 836 in that village that had been identified, and we were able to help 100. So we found that many of the children were also anemic and they were underweight. So we began what we call a food security project where we rent a fourth of an acre, we plow it, provide the seed and the fertilizer, grandma does the work, she harvests her, her uh, products, uh, usually corn and beans, and then she's able to feed her family. Uh, this is a special village for me because uh, now the boy goes to school because he has the school uniform. And in addition, uh, with HART plus uh, USAID, they have uh, funded them. You know, the house they were living in is not really a good house, but now they're going to have a better house for them. Usually on the rain season, uh, the rains were dripping into the house, but now, as this house is going to be completed, they're going to enjoy a very good facility. In the program right now, we have 6,300 children. They're being supported through the Kids for School project. It fits the Kenya standard of what we're trying to do for orphans, keep them in their tribal home, in their village, being cared for by relatives versus orphanages. And they just need a little help. They just need a little support, help them get in, back into school. And with the food security program, and the GOAT for income generating, you can help that whole family survive the HIV AIDS pandemic. We are now able to 
have kids who are saying what well, they want to be doctors, kids who are saying they want to be teachers, kids who are saying they want to be pilots. Eh? And I go, since I'm, I have this uh, teaching background, I encourage them, I talk to them, I tell them, you see, you will make it laugh, you will make it. They are very happy to have been, um, to be part of this project. And now they're saying, Isaac, you know, thank you so much. But I tell me, it's not me. It's actually your community that identified you. And we came in to partner with the community to make a change in your life. And if you're willing, you'll go places. Yeah? The stars <laughs> is the limit. All these children then are being supported through our wheat projects because they make the uniforms. So it's all interrelated and they work together. And, it, and it's been a very um, interesting part that none of our projects are standalones. With the Kids for School, we begin, as we went into the schools, we begin working with the children. Over fourth grade, you begin to see a big decrease in the number of girls in each classroom. And by seventh and eighth grade, uh, in this one village where we went back to so many times, we begin to notice, wow, there's only like two girls in each of those upper grades. And what has happened to the girl child? And assuming that what the problem was is that they were marrying young. But we found out later that a lot of it had to do just with the fact they didn't have a way to take care of their monthly cycle. And when we were talking to the girls, they'll tell you that they were using leaves, they were using cloth or cow dung. So they were missing like five days a month. And if you miss a whole week in a month, pretty soon they were so far behind the boys, their grades were not good, and they would get discouraged and they'd drop out. But we're able to put together now a packet for 300 shillings or $5 that has the 12 packets of sanitary towels, four pair of underwear, and it's supply for the girls for a whole year. So what I realized is I had to have partners in order to do this, and we already had a committee here in Kenya. Everything Kenya's developed around relationships, and so for me to start off kind of on my own and be doing my own thing, I realized it wasn't the right thing. I needed to just, let's join with whatever already is happening here. And so the uh, committee that's already been put together is a Lion Rotary Committee. The two clubs have come together, which is real unusual, and they're working together on this one particular project, Sanitary Tells. And there's five countries involved, and it's Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, uh, Ethiopia, and Eritrea. It is a serious problem out there, and I can tell you that people do not understand this. There was a friend I was talking to on the phone, and I said, I'm coming back to Nairobi to distribute sanitary towels. He started laughing. He said, what are you people up to? What kind of, of project is that? Because people don't understand what girls go through up country. How have the sanitary towels helped us in any way since we started this program? Yes? Yes, sign up. When you don't have sanitary toilets, you cannot come to school. We sit at home until monthly period is finished. Through them and through my partners at AED, we began distributing these underwear and the sanitary towels to girls in schools all over Kenya. And we were looking for those that were the most needy, mostly those up country, and those that would, it would really jeopardize their education if they didn't get this assistance. The girls, we find that they are not only staying in school longer, their grades are better. So we began this whole education piece of uh, how to help the girl child. And then that would lead into questions like, what do you want to be, what are your dreams, what do you want to be when you grow up? And uh, when we would talk about that, we'd say, okay, what could hinder you from accomplishing those dreams? And they always came up themselves, STDs, HIV, early pregnancy, so when we went back and visited a Maasai village where we had uh, given out the sanitary towels and we'd done the education and everything, they had written a poem uh, about themselves and about the empowerment that they were feeling of going on to school and the things that they could do now. I wish I can make it my dream to become true or becoming a doctor. Yes, a doctor. A doctor out of a Maasai girl. We did the logic change. Help, help. Lift me up where all tribes are. Come and join us. Let's make 
this big, they miss out with the money. It was such a joy because you realize, okay, they got it. You know, they've really got it. And no, not only do they have it, they can stand boldly and profess it. You know, that we want to go to school, that we are valuable as girls. Not just boys are valuable in our culture, but we are also valuable. And telling their parents that. It is not a one-year project. It's not a 10-year project. It seems like it's a very long project. And we need all the support possible to keep it going. And I, I will request everyone that please... After we leave this place, try and see wherever, whenever you can to donate some money towards this campaign because it is a campaign which not many people want to talk about because of obvious reasons, but it is making a difference. And I think it is something that we must carry through and through for many years to come. And our goal was to saturate rural Kenya with the prevention message of HIV, AIDS, TB, malaria, and typhoid. That was our goal. We found that we had different spokes coming off. We got the kids for school. We have the girl child. We have the wheat project. We've done water projects. And yet it's the heart teams that are keeping it rolling because they're coming and bringing their resources and helping it going. Then we've had uh, seroptimus teams coming and the rotary and the various uh, different kinds of groups that are coming. Medical teams, and they're not always associated with a church. This is now my ninth or 10th trip. I've lost track. And I actually retired partially to continue this work um, because it's so rewarding and because there's such a huge need here for HIV expertise. And whether it's you have skills in computers, you're a mechanic, <laughs> you're a carpenter, whatever it is, we need it. It didn't matter that I was not a professional medical person because my camera came in handy very much. They were glad to have someone that was there to record what was happening and what they were doing. We just got right down on the ground and treated those patients and it was just like an ER right there on the grass. And it was fantastic to get right in there with a camera. I wanted to come to Kenya, but for four or five years I couldn't do it. Uh, but I can pray. And so I prayed for heart. I prayed for the ministry here, uh, for the people as well as uh, to give financially. Uh, and, and some, you know, I never had a lot of money and, and still don't, but you can, what little you have really goes a long way here. And we started having annual uh, heart dinners. And at one of those heart dinners, I had a Kenyan physician that was working at UC Davis come up to me afterwards and she said, Vicki, you've done so well at showing the uh, the needs in Kenya and how you're addressing them. But what you haven't done is showed the beauty of Kenya. And she said, don't you take them on safari? Don't you let them see all the beautiful things about Kenya? And we decided to incorporate into the team experience a three day, two night safari every time a team comes. had so many people say that I've done more in two weeks to help a larger number of people than I've done all year long. So they take their vacation time, all their money, you know, to come and do this. And it's been totally amazing. What I love about heart is that uh, the way heart empowers the Kenyan people to help themselves for sustainability, that if heart ceases to exist, the Kenyan people don't. They can continue on with what they've been taught. Oh, 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 o